Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I am Tim Erlen, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Craig Young, who's our principal security researcher with the Vulnerability and Exposure Research Team, or VERT, at Tripwire. So he's steeped in the technical details of vulnerability and security research. Welcome, Craig. Hey, thank you, Tim. And Craig, how long have you actually been doing this type of security research out of curiosity? Oh, well, I've been professionally in InfoSec now, I guess, about 15 years, um, more specifically doing vulnerability research over the last eight years, though. Yeah, and it's a pretty interesting field. I mean, it's always been interesting to me, but it's um, something that that uh, never seems to get old, I suppose. Yeah, there's definitely always something to be looking at. Yeah. So today we're going to look at uh, something specific uh, in this case, um, which is MQTT. Uh, and, um, and Craig, uh, why don't you just start by telling us what is MQTT and, and why are we talking about it? Sure. So uh, not to get into too many technical details about it, but this is kind of a very lightweight messaging protocol that's allowing to have entities of different types that have different network connections talk to each other, but without having to maintain direct communication links. So the MQTT broker here is actually going to be directing messages between publishers and subscribers. One way you can kind of think about this is like a TV broadcast scenario. So with the TV broadcast, you've got TV stations who are putting out content um, in MQTT, they would be publishing content. And this data gets out there for anybody to receive it who wants to tune in or subscribe to the right channel. Or in MQTT terminology, it would be a topic. Um, so what's fundamental about this, though, is that you've got a kind of one-to-many situation where one thing can produce a message that's going out to many devices. Um, but it also goes beyond that because unlike a TV broadcast, Anybody that's participating on this network can commonly just feed back data into it and publish their own messages onto whatever channel they want or creating their own channel. And the reason that we're talking about this, the reason this kind of obscure protocol is important is because with the rise of IoT, MQTT has just been exploding in use. And it's being used everywhere from consumer smart home products like locks and uh, alarm systems to absolutely critical infrastructure like pharmaceutical plants and power grid things. Um, and in particular, I'm seeing that it's getting used in a lot of privacy-centric ways. Like I found that there's quite a few of uh, uses of this in fleet tracking and managing taxi services, things like that. So let me make sure I understand the, the model before we dive into some of those those examples. Um, you mentioned smart home products. So if we if we take an example of like a, you know a, a network connected light bulb, um, in that scenario, I assume the the light bulb itself or the light bulbs would be the the subscribers. Is that right? Yes, but they would also actually be um, publishers as well. So the light might want to provide feedback onto the MQTT broker when somebody has physically at that device turned it off. So that okay. way, clients, other assets that are connected could reflect that change of status. So you've got subscribers and publishers and a, an, an object uh, or a node on the, on the network can be both. Where does the broker fit in? What, in that scenario with the light bulb, what would be the broker? Yeah, so the light bulb would report back to the broker, which would be like a server that's operated by the company who sold you that light bulb. And like a server out in AWS or, or yep. Azure or something like that? Yeah, a lot of these things are on uh, public clouds. So my in my light bulb scenario, it's not just that I'm getting network-connected lighting in my house. It's that I'm connecting the lighting in my house through a, a publish and subscribe system to some external entity run by the company that produced the light bulb? Yes, and the advantage for you for this is that you can now have a much easier time, say, having your phone or um, an IoT-type website send a message onto the network to control that light for you without having to actually 
be able to tunnel a connection back to your light bulb. Right. So this is, uh, you know, in this example, I can make sure that my lights are turned on or off when I'm not at home because ultimately the, the control for those lights is available via some, uh, you know, cloud-based or internet connected system. Yep. And this broker is just making sure that it's tracking who's subscribed to all the different topics. So, uh, the different assets, the different nodes on the network are able to get all of the information that they're expecting that's relevant to them. But you mentioned that, um, you know, security in these cases can be somewhat lacking. Um, in other words, there's the ability to publish or subscribe to topics without actually being, uh, you know, an authenticated user. Is that, is that the right way to think about it? Yeah. My understanding, um, as kind of an outsider looking at how industry has been using this is that by default, you're not really getting authentication controls in MQTT environments and that this is up to the implementer to kind of establish what guidelines for authentication and isolation between the different nodes on the network need to exist. So as with as with actually many things, it's it's not that the protocol itself is flawed, it's that the implementation hasn't hasn't adequately, in many cases, hasn't adequately considered security. Yeah, I, more specifically the use, the application. Um because okay. these implementations, the various MQTT brokers that are out there, they will have security features in there that are just not being necessarily used as much as they should be. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So it's a matter of, um, from a research standpoint, you know, you're looking at, uh, examples where, you know, that implementation is, is more open than it should be that allows, uh, you know, you or, or, um, someone more, more malicious, more nefarious than you to, uh, you know, publish and subscribe to the, the topics. Yep. And in the example of light bulbs, that might be annoying, uh, but it's it's hardly um, you know threatening life and safety. But you started to give some examples of where MQTT is being used uh, that aren't light bulbs. So what were some of those examples of where we see it in use today? Yeah. So um, backing up actually for a minute, the most astonishing place where I've heard of MQTT being used and in an insecure manner is a prison. Um, this was something that had been reported on a DEF CON talk a few years back that the researcher who was doing the same type of research that I'm doing now um, had come across uh, what appeared to be a control system for prison cells opening and closing. But when I'm scanning the internet now and looking for what types of servers are being exposed out there, I'm seeing quite a lot of things that are actually just DIY people, which this is probably low risk. But then there are also these massive, um, what appear to be vehicle fleet trackers and stuff like that, uh, which might be businesses that are tracking uh, logistics shipments. Um, some of them are also taxi dispatch services. I've been able to correlate to one or two of these um, ride-sharing apps throughout the world. Um, also, building controls are being put onto these systems in potentially unsafe ways. So I found that a very large provider of office space um, had their building controls exposed. Uh, it was making it so that I could see as people were swiping into their different facilities what their names were, um, other alerts about the system. And for all I know, I could have actually injected messages back into that network to cause doors to open or to stop doors from opening or to set off alarms. And in that case, fortunately, I, I was able to reach out to the organization and help them with that problem. But there are so many more like that that it's difficult to figure out who all of these people are and whether these are even all real systems. But it is clear that people are increasing the use of the MQTT technology, but not necessarily keeping up with locking it down. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire. Dot com. So I just want to acknowledge, uh, you know, I've I've been in this industry for for you know roughly twenty years, and there there are very few examples 
where the real world attack uh, is as exciting as, a, as, as for example, a, a movie might portray. But in this case, what you're talking about is uh, an office building or a, a, a network of office buildings where an attacker could very realistically interject false badge swipes or potentially unlock doors uh, or just understand how people are moving about in a real time fashion. Is that right? I mean, that sounds crazy, but. Yeah, that is right. I mean, I, I can't necessarily say for certainty what somebody can do on all of these systems when publishing messages, because obviously I'm not publishing messages to any of those systems. Sure. What I can say though is I looked at, um, a consumer targeted smart lock who had an insecure MQTT broker out there. And in that situation, I was able to eavesdrop on the communications that my lock had with the infrastructure. I could identify where the lock was, find it in the real world if I wanted to, and actually record the unlock code and play it back at a later time. So there's definitely some big real world implications here. Um, it's unclear how many of the systems though that I'm coming across really are just monitoring as opposed to active control. Yeah, because you're not, you're not actively trying to exploit them in those cases. Right. Yes. I am just sending messages to each server that is listening for MQTT traffic saying, hey, uh, give me a couple seconds of all of the data, all of the messages mm -hmm. that you're willing to give out to an unauthenticated user. And oftentimes you see stuff coming back that is indicating, you know, how many megawatts of power are being generated from a wind turbine or something like that. And yeah, it's it's unclear what would happen if somebody started injecting false messages into that system. Even if it is primarily for monitoring, it's possible that somebody could cause physical damage by causing these um, real-world machines to respond to fake data. Well, and if we know that that the the nodes on that, that network can be both publishers and subscribers, and that, you know, in many cases, companies are implementing, a, you know, a, an MQTT stack that, that they've purchased from somewhere else, that they didn't build themselves from scratch, there's always the very realistic possibility that they they're publishing capabilities that they just didn't implement, but didn't turn off either. So you know that that unknown certainly creates some some risk. Yeah, and in the case with the smart lock vendor, for example, one of the first things that I noticed was that the app sends and receives messages about its disconnected status, and if you just published one of those messages, your app would then say oh, I've been disconnected, and you could prevent the app from ever being able to connect to the network. Mm. Now, when I reached out to the vendor, they were somewhat surprised by this, but they also um, they knew how to deal with it. They knew that you could go in and actually set up controls to say that I'm only going to allow somebody that's provided authentication to actually publish on this channel, or in order to publish on this particular topic, um, you need to have a username that's included in that where your password has been authenticated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's worth pointing out that um, your process here when you find this kind of an issue is is to disclose it to the vendor and, and look for their, their cooperation and remediation, right? Yes, definitely, whenever possible. And there are a lot of organizations that I'm currently just waiting for responses from. I've repeatedly reached out to several of these organizations without, um, some of them have taken down the servers without getting back to me, but others seem to be not getting the message. Maybe my reports are ending up in spam or uh, language barriers are coming in the way. But in actuality, the, the scariest thing that I've personally seen in this research um, is that there is a company that sells next-gen technologies to school districts in a particular country in Asia and this company is exposing the building controls for the school districts that they manage, it appears. Mm. And so this is revealing the names and what looks like a URL to a picture of children that are going to their schools. So now we're, we're crossing this, uh, you know, security and privacy divide, I think, um, where, you know, there's, there's definitely a trend around the world towards increased legislation around privacy. And we have potentially, uh, you know, implementations of, of MQTT that, that have significant privacy disclosure problems as well. Yeah, absolutely. And something that came to my mind is how, how this interacts with GDPR, really. Yeah. Well, that's a great example of a, you know, up and coming privacy yeah. regulation. 
Yeah, I don't think that. Um, I mean, I, I I don't think we've seen an example where uh, you know GDPR has been used in quite this this kind of a scenario. I mean, we've seen breaches that have GDPR implications, and I suppose this could this could be similar to something like a you know a unprotected um, S3 bucket. You know, it's another unprotected resource where you can't really validate if somebody's taken advantage of it, but you you count it as a disclosure. Right. Yeah. So I guess. It is a big question on how you classify when a breach has actually occurred and when the disclosure is necessary. Um, but certainly it would seem that if an MQTT data stream is going to be revealing uh, locational data and and or email addresses or IP addresses mm-hmm. of people within regions that are covered by different privacy laws, it should be a breach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a tough question. I mean, I, it, the question is whether it caused any harm. If I remember correctly, GDPR has some language about um, actually causing harm, um, which we we considered might or might not, um, you know, create a uh, an opportunity to to claim it's not GD. You know, an incident isn't GDPR relevant because it didn't actually cause any harm. Um, but that's a, a tricky argument to make, I suppose. Well, so Craig, I think you know this is interesting. There are examples here. Um, you pointed out this isn't a new problem. It's one that, that existed in the past, but your research has shown that, that it's still a problem or it's potentially getting worse in terms of, of connected MQTT systems. I think the hard question that we have to ask is, you know, what is it that we're supposed to do about it? Other than finding each and every instance and reporting it to a vendor, uh, there's got to be something broader that needs to occur. Obviously, for the people who might be listening who are at an organization that is employing MQTT technology, I would implore you to research this further and make sure that you are using appropriate access controls. But of course, most of these systems are not going to be controlled by people who are getting these messages. So it's it's really a huge challenging problem. And I think it's very similar to the problem of what do we do about these mass number of IoT devices with hard-coded passwords? Is it appropriate that governments need to step in and start kind of being um, cyber police forces and giving citations to organizations, um, not based on reports of breaches, but based on actively identifying security weaknesses and exposures. I don't know. I don't know if that's the future I really want, but um, it certainly feels sometimes like this is an intractable problem. Well, we've certainly seen um, compliance standards and some legislation that's aimed at driving sort of a, a basic low bar around security uh, and security configuration, if you want to think of it in those terms, where where they've addressed things like default passwords. Uh, but something like MQTT specifically is is probably, you know, too narrow to show up in that kind of a, um, a standard. So I, I don't know how you would address it. How would you create a, a sort of a compliance regulation that, that is a big enough net, a wide enough net to capture this MQTT situation? Uh, but not, and not so narrow that, that it, you know, it's, it's impossible to, to enforce. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to go after the description of what the types of data that are being exposed or what the types of control that are being exposed might lead to. And obviously things that have public safety impact, like these power grid accessories, um, it feels like something that is categorically possible to, uh, Make mm-hmm. some rules around that is these this, control systems is, is, need is to be authenticated. Is this the kind of thing that would would show up in a penetration test? Uh, I mean, a well scoped penetration Absolutely. test. Yeah. Well, and, a web penetration test, maybe not, but a, no, a, a well good thorough. Test, okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean that that makes me think that that maybe there's an opportunity that that's the the potential, uh, you know, regulation or compliance um, standard is to you know a regular penetration test or at least a a pen test for newly deployed systems with the right, you know, public safety profile. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense, definitely. Yeah, I mean, maybe I don't care so much about about pen testing light bulb deployments, but door locks, sure. Wind turbines, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, that's one yeah, option. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, go ahead, Greg. With, with consumer products, I guess you've got other options as well, like these uh, cyber UL proposals. Well, you tell me about that. So the idea is generally that we're trying to make sets of standards like these baselines, no hard-coded passwords, things like what you were referring to a few minutes ago, mm-hmm. actually. Um, but 
kind of making it so that consumers will have a way of looking at whether or not a product has done their due diligence, their baseline due diligence to make something that isn't going to jeopardize your privacy or safety. Yeah, so like the underwriters labs kind of test for for safety, but targeted at cyber. Yes. That's the cyber UL. Yeah, okay. Makes sense. Interesting. Well, I don't um I don't think we're gonna solve this problem in this conversation, but the research is is certainly interesting. Um I mean it's always fascinating to find these kinds of, of issues in the in the wild. And I think that the real world implications and the examples you gave are, are particularly uh particularly interesting, frankly. So um I, I'm I'm interested to see where your research goes and, and have it continue and, and see what's next. Uh so thanks yeah, for joining thank us, you. Craig. Thank you for your time, Tim. Yeah, always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, this, again, was the, the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I hope it was interesting for you. It was certainly interesting for me. And uh, I hope you join us for the next episode. Thanks. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Brought to you by Tripwire. Visit tripwire.com.